Well, good morning to you. I'm so thankful that we're able to be together this morning. It's a great time of worship. It's a great time to be uh, with our church family and reflect on things that are found in the scriptures and for us to be geared up again to face another week and to be able to praise God. I'm so thankful. I love this time of year. I love the idea of us getting together and talking about Jesus. And I hope that you have seen that throughout this month, that as Matthew and I have presented lessons to you uh, around this time of year, that they have been Jesus-focused. And if, let me tell you, that's the whole intention. That's what our theme was throughout this whole year, is that we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what our focus is. It's 2020, and we want to have a 2020 vision fixing our eyes on Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that that has been our theme. And I'm thankful for this morning and for the sermon this morning. Now, I have titled this sermon, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. You know, last week was Blue Christmas, and I loved that sermon. It was so much fun to prepare it and to think about it uh, all year long and then to nail it down and, and deliver it last week. I needed it. I needed that kind of a sermon. This morning, I almost changed the title of the sermon because really I felt like I was dreaming more of a foggy Christmas this morning coming in. It's been really bad, and uh, Sean mentioned something about coming in, and it felt like that. Uh, But you know what? It's so funny. While I may be dreaming of a white Christmas, in my mind, I don't really remember a time that I got to celebrate one. Now, Bing did a great job singing this song. I love Bing Crosby singing. I think he's the he's What I hear in my mind when I hear the song, White Christmas, I hear Bing singing it. Isn't that a weird name anyway, the name Bing? Has anybody else named their child Bing? Probably not, right? It's a weird name. I love Bing's version of this. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And he says, just like the ones I used to know. But you know what, Bing? I, to be honest with you, I don't ever remember dreaming of a white Christmas. I, I mean, on, I never, I never really experienced one. The closest I really ever got, I think, to a white Christmas in Arkansas is, uh, well, it was 20 years ago, matter of fact. In, in 2000, uh, if you remember, there was a terrible ice storm that came through. 20 years ago. Yeah, that's right. I know this because uh, Kira and I celebrate our 20-year anniversary of our first date tomorrow. Can you believe that? We've been, we've been dating. I've been your boyfriend for 20 years now. Are you okay with that? It's been fun. I remember that because uh, we, uh, I, w- I came home from uh, Denver uh, and uh, was spending the holidays with my family. We, started, we went out on our first date on the 21st of, uh, of December. We went out to eat at Red Robin in, in Denver, and we went to go see the movie What Women Want with Mel Gibson. Do you remember that? Not a very good movie. It was a good date, though. It worked, obviously. It worked. But after that date, I came home. I, I was with my family for the Christmas holiday and had a good time. But then this ice storm came, and they shut down the, uh, the airport in Little Rock. And uh, I had a flight back to Denver, and it was pretty much canceled. They were going to try to reschedule it. And I, I kept thinking, yeah, but I want to get up to Denver and be with that girl again. I want to go up there and be with, with Kira. We just started dating. I'm like, I want to get up there. So I took a bus from Little Rock to Denver. And I will never do it again. <laughs> never. I, I will do whatever it takes never to be on a bus, especially that far of a trip. We drove through uh, from Little Rock to Amarillo, Texas, and I think Amarillo has like a record of how much snowfall that week it was there. It was just crazy. And then for, through southern Colorado and then into Denver. And I think it took like 22 hours on a bus to get from Little Rock to Denver, but it was for that girl that I wanted to be with. That's, my, that's the closest I got to a white, it was more like an icy Christmas for me. Well, that's good because honestly, I don't really get to dream or I don't really get to have a white Christmas in Arkansas. It seems like really what we do is dream about it. But you know what? The Jews, I know you're thinking, well, what does this have to do with the Bible? Here we go. You ready? The Jews, the Jews dreamt of a Christ that made them white. They probably didn't dream much of a white Christmas either, to be honest with you. 
they didn't really dream. They didn't really even understand the idea of Christmas. That's a holiday that we celebrate. That's not in their culture at all. But I do know that the Jews were looking for a Christ. They were looking for a Messiah that was going to make them white. That's what they wanted. I know this because the scriptures tell us this. I know this because Isaiah tells us this. Isaiah chapter 1, starting at verse 16. Turn over there with me if you're not there. Get your Bibles out. I've got mine out. I want to share with you just real quickly a little piece of this passage that will set the stage for the kind of white Christmas for us that will last forever. A white Christmas for us that will last forever, not a temporary one. Well, the Jews, they were looking forward to a white Christmas in a way. Notice what he, what he says. Isaiah writes and says in verse 16, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. This is the Lord speaking. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. These are just simple little things that we can understand. But it starts off with you needing to wash yourself. The Jews needed to wash themselves. They needed to purge all the evil. Remove the evil from their deeds and away from God's sight. He says so bluntly, cease to do evil. Stop being evil. Stop being wicked is what he's telling them. Clean yourself. And he says, learn to do good. Now, I struggle. I think we all do. We, we have to learn to do good. Sometimes doing good does not just come naturally to us. We teach our kids from early on how to be good. Behave. Do what's right. Straighten up. Learn to do good. And I'm still, I'm 40 years old, and I'm still learning to do good. Learning to do good means that I'm going to seek justice. I'm going to seek what is right. According to this text, I'm going to reprove the ruthless. In other words, I'm going to correct them. I'm going to fix some things. I'm going to set them straight, those that are ruthless, and even myself. I'm going to defend the orphan and plead for the widow. That means that I'm going to take care of people who are less fortunate, those that are suffering in some way, those who are lacking something. I'm going to meet their needs. That's what it means to do good. I have to first start with washing myself. Why do I need to wash myself? Well, he tells us. And he starts in verse 18. And he says this, Come now, let us reason together. In other words, let us think. Let us come to a conclusion. Let us figure out what we need to do. and Let us get together and let's come up with an answer together. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. He's got the answer. And he says this, Though your sins are as scarlet... Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Oh, they were looking for cleanliness. They were looking for purity. They were looking for white through their Messiah. They wanted innocence because they were guilty of doing what was evil. He says, let us reason together. Though your sins are staining you, though you have disgusting sins all over you, they will be made as white as snow. That's the connection for us. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like a sheep's wool. Perfectly, perfectly clean. That's what he's telling us. Now, it's so simple for us because he tells us the answer is found in the very beginning of verse 19. If you consent and obey. You need to wash yourself. And even though you have this, this sin that's staining you, you can get rid of it. You can be clean. You can be pure. You can be innocent. But it's going to take you consenting and obeying. We have to do something. We have to obey in order for us to have this kind of cleansing that he's talking about. Yeah, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, but not just this one-time occurrence. Not this rare occurrence that may happen or may not happen. Which, by the way, I think there's a chance of a flurry Christmas Eve this week. 
Wouldn't that be great? How appropriate. But you know what? It's just, it might come and then it's over. And it, we may not see it again. You may not see a white Christmas in your lifetime. I mentioned Hallmark movies last week. Seems like every Hallmark movie has a white Christmas. Lucky dogs. But you know what? I'm not talking about this holiday really on the 25th. I'm not talking about what the weather forecast may be. I'm talking about a white Christmas. A white purity. A cleanliness that you can have through Christ. Through the Messiah. If you consent and obey, well, then you can dream of a white Christmas that will last forever. It's not a one-time thing. It's not even a once-a-year kind of thing. It's an everyday way of life that will last you for all of eternity. That's what I'm dreaming of. But the only way that I can dream of, and really the only way I can have a white Christmas, is I actually have to stop dreaming about it. I have to stop uh, dreaming about being pure and innocent and clean. And I have to make it into a reality. And it's going to require me washing myself. It's going to require me purifying myself. It's going to require us removing the evil and learning to do good. And let me show you this morning exactly how to do that according to the new testament turn over in your bibles to titus chapter 3 because it is time for us to stop dreaming about having a white christmas and making it into a reality and just like the jews it's going to require us to do something it's going to require us to wash ourselves and get rid of the sins that are in our lives so titus chapter 3 It was read for us just a moment ago by Peyton. Good job, Peyton. Where's Peyton at? Good job on reading. You know, I like the the way that you read because it's clear and we can hear it. I love that. That's so important, and I appreciate that very much. Good job. Oh, this passage is so important to us. It's in the middle of the whole text that I want to share with you this morning, but I want to start here because it starts with that washing. And he says this, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, when Jesus appeared, that kindness, that love for mankind appeared. Right now the world is talking about the appearance of Jesus. The world is talking about His birth. And here Paul, when he writes to Titus, he says, When the kindness of God our Savior appeared, And his love for mankind appeared. He, see that's how I know he's talking about a person at least. He, and I know he's talking about Jesus because Jesus is the only one. The Messiah, the Christ, is the only one that can provide this for us. He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. But according to his mercy. By the washing of regeneration. And the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He tells us the answer to who he's talking about. The kindness and the love that appeared. The ability to save us. The ability to give us righteousness and mercy. The washing. The regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It's all been poured out upon us through Jesus, our Savior. That's what I want. It's by him. I love the fact that Jesus, in his appearing, provides salvation. He provides mercy. He provides washing, regeneration, and a renewing. And he poured it out so richly. Poured it out for us. You know, when you clean something, when you clean something, uh, you, you, you sometimes just need a big pitcher of water to be able to really do a good job cleaning it. All right? Rachel cleaned my brother's truck for him yesterday. Just as a Christmas present. It needed to be cleaned. Really, really bad. And, sa- and Rachel said, we borrowed their truck yesterday. And Rachel said, hey, as a Christmas present, I'm just going gonna, gonna to clean Seth's truck for him. And she did a great job. Wonderful job. You know what? She had to go get a pitcher of hot water and a rag to really do a good job cleaning it. And I saw that pitcher of water after she had used it. You know what color that water was? Black. 
about as black as Brad's shirt. Yeah, but that's exactly right. Black. Now, we're talking about white Christmas, but let me tell you, what I saw in that picture was black. See, the pouring out of that Holy Spirit takes what is nasty and takes what is sinful and takes what is wicked and gets rid of it. And that's the beauty of Jesus. Now, let's look at the broader context. I've picked this little passage out, these, this verse 4, 5, and 6. I've picked it out just to set the stage for us what it means to be washed. But I want us to see what it really means, if we're going to be washed, what it means to have purity, what it means to be clean, and what it means to live innocent in Christ. So that's the, that's the premise of this. I, I get it. It's a stretch to talk about white Christmas. But I want you, when you hear that song, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. I want you to be thinking about the purity and the innocence and the washing that Christ provides for you. Because He appeared, He was born over 2,000 years ago to provide that kind of washing for you. That's what I want us to see. So let's look. Let's look at the, the broader picture to see how we can have a white Christmas that lasts forever. Not a one-day occurrence, not a once-a-year kind of thing, but something that gets you every single day for the rest of your life leading all the way into eternity. I want you to have a white Christmas. And the way that you do this is you be humble. You be humble. Let's look at the broader context. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 3. Paul writes and says to Timothy, remind them. Who? Well, the people that Titus is preaching to, the people that he's ministering to. Remind them. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. It takes humility to be subject to somebody else. It takes humility to be obedient to authorities or those who have power over us. It takes humility. It takes humility to be ready for every good deed. This idea of being ready for every good deed is the idea of being, being we're sitting on go. We're, we're ready to, to move forward. We're not just waiting. We're ready to go. Now, if there's ever a time that we've learned that this year, we've learned that it's going to take me saying, I may not be able to do what I want to do. I, I may have to give in to those who are governing over me. I don't want to, but I want to please God. I want to be humble. And if I'm going to be pure and innocent and clean, I've got to learn to be humble because plans change, don't they? Plans change. And the humble person says, even when things come up that I don't like and that I don't agree with, I'm going to be subject to rulers and authorities and to be obedient and ready for every good deed. Our plans in the future may change. The ministers, we got together with our elders last week and we kind of talked a little bit about some plans that we have for 2021. And we're very excited about some things that we have in the works. And there's no reason that we would be sitting there thinking, well, we just can't plan anything. We go ahead and we plan things. And one of the things that's so interesting about it is every time we would come up with something that we want to do, we all sat there in agreement and said, you know what, though, we may have to adapt. We may have to do it just a little bit different, and we'll see how it goes as we plan it. We may have to change some things, and we may have to cancel something. But we can't sit here, as a church family, we can't sit here with our hands underneath us and plan nothing and do nothing. We have to make plans. But the humble Christian says, you know what, even when my plans change, I'm going to submit. I'm going to be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient because I'm ready. I'm not sitting on my hands. I'm ready for every good deed. Ready, set, go. But be ready 
Your plans may change, and you've got to be humble. You want to have a white Christmas? You want to have a, a Christmas that's pure? Christ provides the opportunity for us to be humble. He provides an opportunity for us to be humble. Now let's keep going, because I think there's more for us. There, there it is. I forgot to put the passage up there. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient and ready for every good deed. Now, the second one is it's time, if we want to have a white Christmas, to be considerate. Be considerate. Look at the passage with me. Verse 2. He says, To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Now, this word malign it means to not slander. Don't slander anyone. Or don't use any kind of profanity. Now, I'm not just talking about bad language. I'm not just talking about cussing. I'm talking about just talking profane and ugly and wicked about somebody else. Malign no one. Don't slander anyone. And let me tell you, that's, we've been guilty of that one. We're guilty of that sometimes. Then he says to be peaceable. And I love this word peaceable. It means don't fight. Don't fight. Be gentle. And the word there, gentle, means that we're yielding. So think about it. Let's look at it again. To malign no one, don't slander, don't talk bad about them, don't use profane language. To be peaceable, don't fight amongst yourselves or with other people. And to be gentle, in other words, yield to somebody else. And then he says our phrase that we're concentrating on, showing every consideration for all men. It's time for God's people to be considerate. Man, we have been guilty of talking bad about other people. We have. I've seen it. I've seen it in our own church family this year. We've got to be careful about it and stop. We've got to learn not to fight, especially among ourselves and really with anyone, but be peaceable. We've got to learn to be gentle. And if we do exactly what this word means, to yield, that means I may not get exactly what I want, but I yield to you. Why? Because I'm showing consideration for all men. Paul says this, he says, be all things to all men. That's being considerate. And we need to be considerate people. If I want to have a white Christmas, if I want to be pure and clean... And have been washed, I'm going to have to be considerate. Number three, I'm going to have to be understanding. Now keep reading with me. In verse three, he says, For we also once were, now notice that's past tense, once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Now, the opposite of being foolish is being understanding. In other words, knowing something. In other words, we need to know what we're doing. We need to be aware of our situations. We need to be uh, in the know about it. Not be foolish. To, to be foolish is, is what he's telling. The, the, the outcome is that you're disobedient. You're deceived and, and that you're enslaved to whatever things that just make you feel good. And pleasures. You're spending your life in malice. Oh, that's a terrible, terrible thing. Spend your life in malice. That word means wickedness. You're spending your life in wickedness. In envy. Hateful. And then he says, he doubles down on it. He could have just left it hateful, that we're hateful. But he says, hating one another. That's somebody who's foolish. That's somebody that is unaware that has no understanding. They're not in the know. And we need to be people that are in the know. He says, you were once that way. You were that that foolish people. You were the people that were disobedient and deceived and enslaved to whatever you wanted to do that just felt good. And you spent your life, your whole life was focused in on just wickedness, envy and hating, being hateful. And I, I... it steps on my toes, hating one another. I hope and I pray that through this we've learned how important it is for the church here in Batesville to be unified. One united front. 
We may not agree on everything, but if I'm going to do what the previous verse says and be gentle, I need to yield to you and you yield to me. I've got to learn not to hate. If I learn how to not be this way as these people once were, that I'm going to be understanding. I'm going to be in the know of how to behave. Then right there in the middle of our passage is the text we've already covered. But I just want to make a quick little point about it and, and, and just talk about it. He says, but when the, the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. And I love this right here. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. You see, you're not saved because of all the good things that you've done. You're not saved because you've baked cookies and given them to your neighbor. You're not saved because you've loaded up food boxes for people that need food, that have nothing to eat. You're not saved because you've slipped somebody a 20 at the grocery store and helped them load their groceries. You are not saved based upon the deeds, the good things that you've done. Those are good things, and we tend to do those good things, but that is not what saves you. You are saved by His grace. And his mercy. And I'm thankful for that because I can't do enough. And there's times that I just don't do. But his love and his mercy is what saves me. And he says, by the washing and the regeneration. I think he's alluding to baptism. I think he's talking about the, the cleansing that we have in, in baptism. Uh, I, because he talks about the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And if we... Reference back to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We understand that those people that when they repented and they were baptized, that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. That promise was not just for them. He goes on to say that it's the the promise is for all the generations to come. And so I think Paul is alluding to that, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. He says, whom he poured out upon us richly, not just a little bit. He's given it to us in abundance. He doesn't hold back at all. He gives us the Holy Spirit in a wonderful, beautiful way. That seals us so that we can have a white Christmas that lasts forever. Not just a one-time occurrence. And if we're going to be a part of that washing, then we're going to have to live a certain way. And he goes on to tell us exactly how we need to be living. We need to live because we're justified. Be justified. Be justified. Here's what he says. In verse 7, he says, So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I love this. I love the idea of being justified. I, I can stand before God not based upon the works that I've done. He's already said that in verse 6. Not based upon those kinds of things. He, I'm able to stand before God as if I've, sin, as if I've never sinned because I've Stand before Him by His grace. Again, the mercy and the grace. That's how I can become an heir according to the hope of eternal life. That's the part that lasts forever. It keeps going. I'm able to stand before God as if I've never done anything wrong. All those foolish things that I'm guilty of back in verse 3, I stand before God as if those things never happened. That's... A white Christmas that lasts forever. Now the last one is one that is more applicable into our lives. One that we can easily just apply. Because he says this. He says that we need to be vocal. Now he tells Titus. He says this. He says, verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak. Not just speak but speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. I love this. I love this. It's a trustworthy statement. Now, I don't know if he's necessarily talking about the statements that he's already made or the statement that he's making now. It doesn't even matter. Both of them are true. Both of them are trustworthy. And he says... Whatever the case is, I want you to speak confidently about these things. 
Speak confidently about these things. He's already said that earlier to Titus. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now he says again, Be vocal, confidently vocal, so that those who believe in God, that's you and I, I think you believe in God. Everybody in here, I think, believes in God. Hope I'm not assuming too much. You're here this morning, I think, because you believe in God. Those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. Speak confidently. Be vocal. Be vocal about the grace. Be vocal about the justification. Be vocal about being subject to people. Be vocal about being considerate and understanding. Be vocal. Tell people. Speak out about this. The world is talking about the appearance of Jesus over 2,000 years ago. Now is the time to be vocal and say it. And tell people about the grace and the mercy that saves you. It's time for us to be vocal. Speak confidently. That's a trustworthy statement. He says the very end of verse 8. These things are good and profitable for men. It's good. We've got to engage in these good deeds. And engaging in what is good gives us that white Christmas. The word good here is used two times at the very end of this verse. He says that we engage in good deeds. And he says these things are good. This word good means beautiful. So read it with me again. That we engage in beautiful deeds. And that these things are beautiful and profitable for men. That word men there is humankind. All people everywhere. Not a gender. It's for everyone. Every single person is to engage in these good deeds. That's what's going to give us this white Christmas. If we're going to be pure, if we're going to be clean, we need to do exactly what he's saying. These things are good and profitable. It's good for you. Let's do these things that he's telling us in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. What a wonderful thing. It's good for us. So if we want to please God, and I think you do, I think you want to please God, then we're going to have to have a clean heart. We're going to have to wash ourselves. We're going to have to get pure. We're going to have to be innocent. And the way that we do that is we be humble, we be considerate, we be understanding, we be in the know. We be justified, and then we be vocal. We tell other people about it. I may be dreaming of a white Christmas even this year. It'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? I've always thought that basically we've had a few snow days around here since I've lived here. Beautiful. One, one day last year it snowed. It was absolutely beautiful, but the roads were absolutely clear. We could get around. Ah, oh, just gorgeous. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see a white Christmas. I wish it was a white Christmas every year. I'd stay home. I'd sit by my fire. I'd drink hot chocolate. Oh, man. But you know what? I'm not talking about the weather forecast. I'm not even talking about the holiday coming this Friday. I'm talking about a Christmas. I'm talking about the purity that's found in Christ that lasts forever. And instead of dreaming about a white Christmas, it's time for us to start living a white Christmas. This is a way of life. That's how it's going to last forever. And the only way that you're going to be able to enjoy the washing, the purity, and the cleanliness that's found in Christ is if you stop dreaming about it and you start making it a reality. And start living it. That's how you have a white Christmas. This morning is an opportunity for all of us. I'm going to respond to for all of us in our hearts to see what I can do better in my own life. Maybe I need to learn better to be humble and be considerate and be understanding. Be appreciative of being justified. And maybe I need to be more vocal. Maybe you do too. And if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation and repent of sins that are in your life, you can do that this morning. 
that I cannot dismiss us just yet without talking to you about how you can truly be washed in his blood. Isn't it odd that when Isaiah is writing what the Lord says, he talks about washing the sins and though your sins be as scarlet in the redness, they'll be white. But then when we get to the New Testament, you wash yourselves in the blood, the red blood of Jesus. Isn't that ironic? I think God's in, intentional with that. I think he wants us to see how remarkable it is. Because I don't know about you, but when you clean your bathroom or you clean your, your kitchen or you clean your uncle's truck, nobody gets blood out. And cleanses it with blood. Physically that'd be impossible. It's just ridiculous. To think you're going to clean something with blood. But God doesn't do things that just make sense. God doesn't do things in the spiritual way. The way that we do things in the physical way. He takes the blood metaphorically. Takes the blood of Jesus. And cleanses you. So that you can stand before him innocent and pure. Blood is what makes you pure. And the only way to have that blood wash you is to touch the blood. The only way to touch the blood is to go back to the death of Jesus. The only way. Now, none of us can go back in time and go back to the death of Jesus. Nobody can physically get that blood on us. But Romans chapter 6 talks about us reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's the only way that you can touch the blood is when you're buried with him in baptism. You are buried with him into his death. That's how you touch the blood. That's how you become washed. That's how you get rid of the sin and the yuck and the wickedness. And the dirt. And I'm not talking physical. I'm talking spiritual. It's the only way that you can become clean. It's the only way to have a white Christmas. Be pure. And be washed in the blood of Jesus. If you need to respond and obey the gospel this morning. Or if you need to respond and ask for prayers of your church family. Come as together we stand and as we sing.